There are so many voices in this country that are speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester, Rochester Indie Media. Hi, I'm Dawn Zapelli, the Barefoot host with Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV, and today we're going to be talking about re-entry, coming out of the prison world into society and what that experience is like, and to help us understand this reality and what's happening with people um, right now in our county, Monroe County, and throughout New York State is Ann Graham from the Catholic Family Charity Service Center, and uh, it's the re-entry program. Did I say that right? Yeah. It's a mouthful. And Johnny Merrill, who's a volunteer in the program, and who has, as a youthful offender, spent more than 25 years incarcerated behind bars, and now has have, has six months in society as a free citizen. Uh, I like to think that uh, you feel like a free man now, and uh, it's been a good experience for you being out, and you're here to share your experience with us. And thanks for coming mm -hmm. to do that, both of you. Uh, let's start with the Catholic Charity um, Family mm -hmm. Service Reentry Program. Mm -hmm. It's a mouthful. What it's is it exactly? It's actually the Monroe County Reentry Task Force at Catholic Family Center. There you go. A couple years ago, the Division of Criminal Justice Services, who oversees prisons and, and uh, parole and whatnot, realized that we're in a crisis with folks coming out of prison. We lock a lot of people up, they come out. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of them were going back, almost 69% were going back. So they realized these sort of problems require local solutions and partnerships, collaborations across human services, faith-based groups, law enforcement agencies, housing providers, and whatnot to try to work together as a community because it's an issue of community safety in addition to it's the right thing to do. So mainly your goal is to want to see people um, have a smooth transition back into society and a successful, and life. A successful life and uh, not necessarily working with um, decreasing sentencing with the courts, getting people out. I mean, it's really... You know, we're per I mean, our mission is to focus on making people successful back in the community so that they're not likely to commit any more crimes. But of course, we'll always have our eye on what's happening with all those other things as well. And Johnny, uh, how did you find the um, re-entry program? Actually, I was, uh, <laughs> I was, just came home, I was lost, clueless, and nowhere to go, and I was, um, coming from Salvation Army, trying to get a birth certificate so I could get ID. And someone said, uh, you know, they have this place called Catholic Family Center. They might be able to help you. And um, I went down, checked them out. And, you know, although I had maxed out on parole, it was a situation that warranted more attention than just me being out. And so they investigated and said, well, listen, I think that you could use our services and here I am, I've been there since. What does it mean to be maxed out on parole? Meaning that I don't owe parole any more time. So I'm, you know, a citizen with a felony. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard that makes it a little easier sometimes that um, people who've been incarcerated say if you have to take the time in prison, I don't know if they're being a little sarcastic when they say that, but it's so difficult on the outside to follow all the restrictions of parole that uh, could lead you back that it's just easier to do the time. Do you think that's true? there's truth to that? There is truth to it, but on the other side of the coin, I mean, being off parole, you're not privileged to all the assistance that you would be able to get if you were still on parole doing right. Because now it's, you're on your own and if you don't have any support systems, 
then you're likely to do the easier thing, which is what you knew how to do, go commit more crimes, go get another case, go back to prison, or in this day and time, a graveyard, whichever one comes first. And uh, Johnny's case is unique, I mean, right? Because he spent so much time as a youthful offender too at 14, and you're 46 years old and just for six months now have been living outside of the prison institution for, as you were saying earlier, just more added, added parole time that had nothing to do with the initial crime. Just talk about that, how, bring us back to 14 and those years and what that experience was like and how you couldn't get out from under it. I mean, well, when I got incarcerated, it was, you know, I was naive to the law and didn't understand all the formalities that the lawyers go through to get you to go along with the program. And once you leave that sitting and you go to the prison system, it was a whole nother world opened up to you because everything they said holds no weight. It was just blowing smoke. So once you get in there, it's like, wow, he didn't say this. He didn't say anything about that. I didn't expect this. And now you have choices to make. And in most cases at that time, this is 1980 and 81 now, if you don't stand up for yourself for whatever the reason might be, then you're gonna be a victim to somebody for whatever the reason, sexual, financial, or whatever, but if you don't defend yourself, then you're gonna be abused, and I refuse to be abused. So- You had to fight, and then fighting gets you in trouble. Yeah. And, and to be clear, the offense that sent Johnny to prison was not a violent offense. And he's 14 years old. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I believe any 14-year-old can be, uh, you know, have a chance for reform for whatever offense there is and does not deserve a lifetime behind bars. So how unique is this? Are we seeing, are, is Johnny's story really an exception to what's happening? Well, not, not really in a lot of ways. I mean, we do get a lot of folks who've done significant periods of time, 15 years, 20 years, more than 20 years. Um, sometimes those were homicides. And is there a direct correlation? The longer you've been incarcerated, the harder the reentry is. It just makes you no. Know, it's it's like holding a tiger by the tail. How do you let it go? Well, the longer someone is in prison, the bigger the chances are that they're traumatized and they're debilitated and they're institutionalized. And it takes a long time to become deinstitutionalized, and some people never become deinstitutionalized. So we've sort of taken people who had some issues but needed help, and now we've completely debilitated them and turned them loose. And Johnny, when we come back, we're going to have to go to a break right now, but when we come back, we want to hear kind of about your experience coming out and what your challenges have been and, um, you know, the exciting moments of liberation and freedom and that moment of, like, walking out and um, where, what it's been like the last six months. So we're going to take a break. You can uh, check out Rochester Indie Media. We have a website. It's um, rochester.indymedia.org and you can post an article, you can get involved with us, you can watch our program two times a week on public access. Stay tuned, Rochester Indy TV. <laughs> Today, many of the battles that we fight are in the courtroom for our sacred right of sovereignty. So red nation rise, Native American rights fund. I can make a change in the names of my ancestors so they didn't die in vain. But together, calling the tribes to action. One nation, can you imagine? Grandma once said our people will thrive. 500 years and we still survive. Narf, the Indian wars never ended. The only change venue to be continued. Visit narf.org. Okay, kids, here we are at the slavery exhibit. Now, as you can see, the slaves were kidnapped from their homes, chained together for weeks. They would cram them onto these ships in very appalling conditions. Thousands of women and children are being smuggled across the border. Sexual trafficking of children. As you can see right here, they were treated like animals. 
They worked all day long for no pay. In sweatshops raided by police, children forced into slave labor. Some of the slave masters were very cruel. They whipped them and they beat them, as you can see in some of these pictures. Torture and assault well, brutal, even fatal. So, before moving on, are there any questions? Um, does this still happen today? Okay, so we're back, and uh, we're just going to launch right in. I want to give uh, Johnny enough time. I mean, I think we could, you, you, your life has a book here, and we could spend a lot of time talking to you about uh, your experiences, but uh, when you initially got out after 25-some years incarcerated, what, what's that like? Bring us to that moment. Now you're walking out a free man with $40 and uh, what, a bus pass? Bus or pass. You had no ID on you. None. I mean, for me, it was, it was a surprise. I was <laughs> paranoid. I mean, surprise was an understatement because I was lost and I virtually had nothing but those forty dollars and and, and and I was trying to find people I knew, you know, places that I could go and because I didn't want to be in that shelter environment because that claustrophobicness that that people around me thing just hadn't settled yet and I was still thinking well am I being tricked or what's really going on are they trying to get me this way or you know so aside from those psychological issues that I was going through the physical thing was where you're gonna live how you're gonna eat what are you going to do when the $40 run out? How long are you going to make the $40 last? And who are you going to contact? Where are they at? Should I contact them? Because if they're tricking me at it, I don't want them to know I went there or here. So, I mean, I had a whole lot of mental things going on and a whole lot of physical things, readjustment and trust, you know? And then... Where did you go? I mean, like I said, after I left Salvation Army and, and I was fortunate to just haphazardly meet my cousin on her lunch break and I stayed with her a couple of days and then a niece and that situation wasn't conducive to what I was trying to establish for myself. And finally at the Catholic Family Center, they opened up a lot more doors for me and invited me into their program, which has helped stabilized me and find you know allow me to reach back in myself and, and 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 feel alive and human again so that i can be a people's person and be a trustful person and a, and, and a trustworthy person and you know it gave me back those elements that were stripped out of me how do you do that Anne? how does your program give all that to back to someone well i think part of it is we have a wonderful staff very committed people and you know, I think we talked before about, we really don't think, we're not serving inmates, we're serving men and who've been in prison, and women, um, fewer women. And we really just feel, you know, we love people where they are, sort of unconditionally. There's accountability, there's dignity, there's respect, but, you know, it's not an us and them thing. They're not sick and we're not fixing them. You know, no program ever fixed anybody. People fix themselves. When they have the opportunity, the tools, the motivation, the time to do it, they do it. If they can do it, they'll do it. And we just really are there to troubleshoot and help people problem solve and to get some of the worst stuff out of the way. You can't concentrate on, you know, if you, if you for example, had a chemical dependency problem, it's pretty hard to focus on resolving that issue if you don't know you're going to sleep tonight. Mm -hmm. So, Do you have to deal with all of the um, misconceptions and stereotypes that workplaces have or mm -hmm. society? Do you try to it's work difficult. on changing that? Imagery? We do. You know, we recently hosted a big breakfast for landlords, private landlords, because we really try to get folks into permanent housing and, and out of a temporary environment right away. And of course, landlords are understandably maybe wary if they do background checks and they see someone hit a felony or is in prison a long time. So we brought about 80 landlords together and for the most part, they were very receptive. 
you know, when we explained, we, and, and Parole came with us to talk, and we explained that, you know, we work in partnership with the guys who come to the program. We're there to help. You know, we, we make sure the rent will get paid and everything else. What know. are the biggest misconceptions that you want to break? It seems like a lot of people think if you've been in prison, you did you're something dangerous. Horrible. Like, you can right. hurt me and I have to be right. afraid of you. Right. There's a lot of fear. And how do you There is a that? lot of fear. I mean, of the 63,000 people that are in just state prisons right now in New York State, only about 28% of them committed a violent offense. And when we say a violent offense, it doesn't mean they actually did something violent. It could be a legislatively violent offense, like, for example, um, a vehicular manslaughter where there was no intention to do any harm. Mm -hmm. um, everybody else is pretty much there on property crimes, which is like burglary or auto theft or something like that, and drug charges. The drug charges, well, the those have charges. just inflated with oh, since oh, the Rockefeller drug laws the yeah. last 20 years, and they're trying to mitigate some of that now, right? They are trying to mitigate it, not fast enough to suit most of us. Um, the longer people are in prison, the harder it is for them to have a life when they get out. The, the harder it is on the community. There are neighborhoods in this city that are absolutely decimated by incarceration, where you can barely find an adult male on the street. An adult male of color, African-American male, primarily, well, about 50 right? Fifty percent of the prison population is African-American. And so it does seem like these are economic crimes. And they are. They, in there's a lot an of economic ways. component Certainly, to there this. Is. You know, or mean, lack of opportunity, lack, lack of education, you know, um, not the right lawyer, not the right family support at the time. That right. Yeah, it's very frustrating. Um, so, Johnny, another exception, you have a big family. You said you had nine children before you went in at 16. And uh, what was your connection with your family all these years? And um, both for family members who want to be supportive while people are in prison, what would you tell them? And for uh, the community outside who maybe doesn't have a family member but wants to uh, support prisoners, what kind of... Um, forms of solidarity or support, looking back, could have been helpful to you? I mean, all the support that I needed at my, my particular time of incarceration was there. It was just that the extent of my time was so long that, you know, that thrill of, of, of you know, me being gone, me being in this experience was weighing on them after that time, you know, passed by and everyone started growing up and having their own kids and, you know, their life kept going. My life was still going, but it was at a standstill because, you know, the inside world of prison and the outside society were moving at two different, it's like, they were going, you know, at light speed and here we are traveling in slow motion. Mm -hmm. So even though we knew mm -hmm. the changes that might have been taking place in society and all these different events, it was, it, it still hasn't caught up. So and I've after, learned. After our break, I hate to interrupt you there. We have to go to a quick break. And when we come back, I want to hear what you've learned and how you're catching up now that you've been back these six months out in society here with us and welcome back and glad to have you here and thanks again and stay tuned Rochester Indie Media Indie TV Chill out don't tell me to chill out when you're stealing my things I wouldn't have to raise my voice if you just give it back and stop being like a criminal I don't have your cell phone Oh god look at yourself What are you offering Is this a thief's uniform? You see all these people standing around here why am I the one? I'm sorry homie okay what? Don't make this a big deal. Just give it back, okay? Did you see me? Did yeah, you see you me? Yeah, you know, I just know you took it. Where are your witnesses? Look at Where are your witnesses? Did you see me? Did you see me? Hey, you left us in the bathroom. Us before it's too late. It's already too late. 
I've worked for you a long time, and I'm paid less than Robin. Holy discontent. Same job, same employer means equal pay for men and women. No time for jokes, Batgirl. It's no joke. It's the federal equal pay law. Holy act of Congress. Can we talk about this later? Will Batgirl save the dynamic duo? Will she get equal pay? Tune in tomorrow or contact the Wage and Hour Division listed in your phone book under the U.S. Department of Labor. We're talking about reentry coming out of uh, prison into, back into society. And um, Johnny, you're talking about your family. Now, this is a really interesting thing because your family, they're having birthdays and births and deaths and all these things are happening and you're in prison not able to be a part of that at all so when you come out how connected do you really feel to this family that's your family and how is that process of getting reconnected I think that's what you're talking about is that I mean for me it is difficult I mean I had seven brothers and sisters and they're all deceased now and my kids are grown. Our kids have kids. So, I mean, it's, it's so difficult because the connection between that second and third generation isn't there. And everyone else is like in a whole different place than I have been. So it's like, well, I love you, but you haven't been there for me. What can you tell me? I've been doing it this long, I'll continue. They felt that you weren't there for them, or? Exactly. And so you think, there, is there, do you feel that there's a lot of anger from family members, or just yeah. detachment? Or? It's anger, detachment. I mean, even though they might understand, it's not enough to curtail the anger for your not being there, whatever the reason have been in their minds. So, Anne, does your program address those kind of family dynamics and the we difficulties? Do. We, How? We really work on family reunification issues. You know, we have 60 beds at Orleans Correctional Facility um, that we target a lot of services to, and there we really work on trying to heal some family stuff, giving families an opportunity to work on some issues. Um, a lot happens while people are in prison, you know, even when it's not such a long stretch as Johnny did. You know, often there's a, a woman in the community, maybe with kids, struggling to get along, paying the additional expenses of having a loved one in prison, visiting and trying to bring packages and whatnot. Kids who are growing up without their dad, um, who are happy to see him come home, but we call it the after the barbecue syndrome, mm -hmm. where it's like, it's very exciting for the first month, and after that, it's like, don't tell me what to do, where were you when I was? Mm -hmm. So we do try to provide supports around issues like that. Mm -hmm. Is that getting better as time goes on now? Are you feeling the connections that you've had some time so you're sharing these experiences now and it, it's slow. You've only had six months so you have high expectations. Do you feel like you've had to lower your expectations from when you had dreams and what were your dreams coming out? This is going to happen and then the reality of that. How different was that? I mean for me those those dreams weren't shattered but they were stored so far back because you know, from that teenager with all these expectations and, and, and hopes of his lawyer's words ringing true didn't happen for so long. And after all the different ordeals that I went through just to get to this point, it's like I had no intention of even being here this You've day. You've given up so much already exactly. along the way. And I've lost so much. So I'm not trying to play catch up. I mean, I would love beyond a doubt to reconnect and, and, and reestablish a relationship with my kids and grandkids and great grandkids. But I know that it's going to take time and I'm willing to work with that. But I also understand that I can't force an issue that's, you know, not there to be, you know, if, if they want to continue on and keep going and don't want me a part of it. I tried, but it hurts, but I have to move forward. I can't keep going backwards and saying, well, because this pain will kill me, that pain will kill me, this. So it's so many different things that will tear me down. I try to find things that help build me up. And where do you see now? What's your, what are your semi-short-term, long-term goals now that you want to see for your life, this stage of your life? 
I mean, right now, I just want to get me together enough so that I could stand up and help somebody else. But in the process of doing that, I want to continue to try to find myself. And with Catholic Family Center, I'm able to continue to reach out, explore different avenues, have different opportunities come to me and embrace those and accept that as family and keep moving on because without a and it's like, what else is there to do but go back to the easy thing, which is to do wrong mm -hmm. and take my chances with the consequences. So and the program gives meaning and purpose and opportunity and connection to people, it sounds like. We try. Um, but it sounds, I'm sure there's a limitation with the numbers coming out. So are there mm -hmm. other ways that people can, can help? help? Like what are the things that people sure. can do? Um, mentors, people, or even families, a church group who's willing to mentor uh, someone who came out of prison. And that could look like a whole lot of different things. Um, people who are willing to donate furniture or clothing or uh, food. You know, everyone assumes there's somewhere out there all these things exist, but they don't. You know, we have to get them. You know, people who are willing to um, drive or transport folks, um, there's a big demand for that. Even, even things like helping somebody with literacy issues. Anyone who's even interested in any way, I would just encourage them to call us at the program. We'll be more than happy to work with them. They can come down, have a look around. It's a very warm, welcoming place. We want people, you know, especially the guys who are coming, if they're not welcome anywhere, they're welcome with us. And we want them to know that. Mm -hmm. And what would you like to tell people, Johnny, just of, you know, people outside who maybe haven't, or think that they don't, although, I was reading the numbers of the population now who've been incarcerated are so high that, that we could be called a society of ex-felons, that we make up the population as two countries like France and Germany or something, a people that uh, have been incarcerated under these felonies because of the way the justice system works right now and the charges and the laws and um, whatnot. But uh, for people who think that they don't know a felon or have these fears, what, what do you say to people? I mean, they have to be more open-minded and less, not trustful, but chance worthy of them. Because mm -hmm. without opportunity, regardless to how long I'm incarcerated and how well I address my issues, without the chance to explore that avenue and you know embrace it, it's not gonna make a difference because you're still gonna have your doubt and I'm still gonna have that problem of trying to prove myself and we're just gonna clash and clash and that clash is just gonna lead me one way and you just say, well, I told you I was right. Mm -hmm. We're gonna prove them all wrong. <laughs> you look like you're heading on, your, on the road to success and good things and thank you for coming. It was nice talking to you and thank John, you for coming. Thanks. And uh, stay tuned for other Indie TVs. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.